What the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at Noah More Parties. And you can find my written work on running backs for Dynasty Leagues, Debbie Leagues, uh, Redraft Leagues now. Uh, I got rankings up there um, at NoahMoreParties.com. And today, I started doing projections. I'm now a professional projectionist. Nine out of ten doctors say that my season-long running back projections are the best in the fantasy business and I just put them together, and I'm going to use those along with my subjective opinions to talk about my top 12 running backs in, di or not Dynasty, in redraft leagues in 2023. Let's get it. <laughs> but we're actually going to start below the bottom at RB13 with Derrick Henry. For the mouth breathers out there, Derrick Henry, I do not have him as an RB1 but I wanted to talk about him in this video just because, I don't know. Uh, I have him at 16 PPR points per game this season, which is pretty good. That would be his lowest in a few seasons, but that's usually an RB1 quality number. But I have him at 4.25 yards per carry this season for, that. I think that would be the lowest of his career, at least the lowest since he was a rookie, for a couple reasons. Number one, he's going to be playing behind maybe the worst offensive line in the league. I looked at offensive line rankings from several different websites, Pro Football Focus, uh, Pro Football Network, uh, Warren Sharp's website, like, you know, a few different offensive line rankings uh, of articles that put together like preseason rankings for the upcoming season. The Titans were last on like every single one of them. This is not a good offensive line. They averaged like 4.34 yards per carry as a team last season. Not great. And on top of that, Derrick Henry is, what, he's going to be 29, 28 years old. And this season, he crossed the 1,500 carry threshold that I talked about, I think it was in my last video, is an important threshold for determining the age cliff for running backs. Like, when can we expect running backs to begin to decline? Derrick Henry looked like he was beginning to decline two years ago when he got hurt and when prior to that he was the least efficient he'd been since his rookie season. We're now two years later than that. He's now over the, the career carries threshold we don't want to see. He's still going to get a ton of volume. It's just harder and harder to bet on that being enough for him when it seems reasonable to expect him to decline a little bit, when he doesn't get a ton of work in the passing game. They just added DeAndre Hopkins. And not like he's, you know, directly competing with DeAndre Hopkins for targets, but they both can't get one on the same play. That's not good for his target volume. Might improve the offense overall a little bit. But this just isn't a good, good offense. Not a good offensive line. It's tough to bet on Derrick Henry and his volume being enough the older he gets and really the worse his team gets. Um, so he's, I don't have him as an RB1, but my, my guy at RB12 though, the first RB1 here, is Najee Harris, kind of for an opposite reason I'm, I'm as Derrick Henry. Like, this this offensive line has not been good so far in Najee Harris's career. We know he's never averaged even four yards per carry. It's been a sieve that he's running behind. But they're supposed to be decent this year. Those, those, those websites I looked at for those offensive line preseason rankings had them right around the middle of the league. They actually averaged a ranking of 14 among those websites. Najee is healthy. He wasn't healthy last season perhaps playing behind a competent offensive line, playing with a non-rookie and non-39-year-old noodle-armed quarterback for the first time in his career. Like, Kenny Pickett is no longer a rookie. This could be the most competent quarterback play that Najee Harris has ever had in his professional career, along with the most competent offensive line play he's ever had in his career, while also being healthy for the first time since he was a rookie. It seems like a decent recipe for success. I have him over four yards per carry for the first time in his career. I have him averaging 4.1 is my projection, and I have him getting a little bit of a bounce back in the receiving game. The Steelers threw the ball I think like right around 100 times less last season than they did when Najee Harris was a rookie. He also didn't have as high of a route participation rate. His target share went way down as a result, but he was good as a receiver in college. He was good as a receiver as a rookie. Maybe last year was just, okay, you know, he's not running as many routes because he wasn't playing very well and he wasn't very healthy. And the Steelers might have just thrown the ball a lot less because they had a rookie quarterback. Either one of those things could improve this season and he could get, you know, a bounce back in the receiving game. One stat that really jumped out to me when I was doing this research was Najee Harris was, I don't remember if his targets or routes run, but it's basically the same with this particular stat. He was targeted on like 26 screens as a rookie. The screen pass is the most efficient on a per route basis for running backs. That's an important thing to have in your repertoire if you're going to score a lot of fantasy points. 26 screens as a rookie, that's a lot. Last year, five. Like a massive dip 
in receiving usage just in the screen game. Like, we're not even talking about, you know, letting Najee get back out there and split out wide or, you know, beat linebackers across the middle of the field on an angle route. He can do those things, but he wasn't even being given the opportunity to just do the most basic things in the receiving game last season. If Matt Canada decides to go back to what worked for them when he was a rookie, they decide to throw the ball a little bit more, he just plays a little bit better. Like, I, I like a bounce back season for Najee Harris. He's my RB12. My RB11 is one that I'm I'm really shocked to have at RB11 because I thought I was high on Jonathan Taylor, but turns out I'm not. I'm currently projecting the Colts to be number one in the league in rushing attempts with Anthony Richardson at quarterback. You know, having a rookie quarterback is going to skew them run heavy anyway. But on top of that, Anthony Richardson is himself an excellent runner. So he's going to run the ball a lot. That takes away some passing attempts. Like, I, I just think this is going to be a very run-heavy team. They've got, you know, veterans of the Eagles coaching staff on there. Shane Steichen was with the Eagles, uh, is now the head coach with the Colts. They just had a lot of success running Jalen Hurts frequently, running the ball frequently as a team overall. Like, there's going to be a lot of rushing volume in Indianapolis this season, and their offensive line should bounce back. Like They have one of the most talented offensive lines in the league. They're dedicating some of the most salary cap money to offensive line in the entire league. Like There's no reason for their offensive line to have been as bad as it was last season. If they you know, kind of regress to the mean of their own level of play this season, they could have a big boost in rushing efficiency on top of a boost in rushing attempts. I have JT back over five yards per carry after he was below it last season. Um, and I also have him getting the highest share of running back rush attempts in his backfield of any player in the entire league. Like, I expect him to dominate touches in this running back room. The best guys behind him are who? Deion Jackson, Evan Hull, uh, Zach Moss. Last year, he had like 82% of the, the running back rushes when he was healthy. Right around there, maybe a slight jump um, in that number because there's there's nobody behind him that deserves touches over him. On third down, on first and second down, the only thing they're going to need is a breather back. Maybe Evan Hull will sprinkle in on third downs a little bit, but they're not going to be throwing the ball a lot anyway. And because of that, because they're not throwing the ball a lot, there's just not enough to go around for like the smash outcome I was envisioning for Jonathan Taylor to be really attainable without just being fueled by a ton of touchdowns. And and that could happen. Like, it's possible that this offense is just much more effective than we think it will be. Anthony Richardson gives them more red zone opportunities than, than we think he will. It's possible that Jonathan Taylor just rips off a bunch of long touchdowns. Like, he's capable of getting hot and doing that. But those aren't things that we want to, to bank on as, like, median outcomes. And Jonathan Taylor's median outcome, I think, is just high efficiency on pretty high rushing volume, not a lot of receiving work, and maybe just a decent amount of touchdowns, and that makes him my RB11. Uh, my RB10 is Jameer Gibbs. I was surprised to be this high on him in my projections. The projections don't correspond directly to the rankings, but I've ranked them after having done the projections and, you know, kind of calibrating from there. So, Jameer Gibbs's projections really caused me to kind of reevaluate the upside I viewed in him for his rookie season. I have him at about 140 carries, 75-ish receptions, 10-ish touchdowns, which seems pretty good. That's basically just a little bit better than, De than DeAndre Swift played at a 17-game pace throughout his three seasons in Detroit. Like, this, these aren't super aggressive numbers for Jameer Gibbs. I think the biggest difference is I have him a little bit more efficient than, than DeAndre Swift was, and I have him at, at both in the running game and the receiving game. A little higher yards per carry, a little higher uh, yards per reception than DeAndre Swift had, but volume and involvement, essentially the same. And and, and like the, the, the efficiency I have him pegged for isn't even that high. Like it's equivalent yards per reception is what James Cook had last year, much lower yards per carry. I think James Cook was at 5.7 last year. I have Jameer Gibbs at 5.0. Like he doesn't have to be Alvin Kamara efficiency-wise as a rookie to smash. He can just be part of a decent offense, get like a third of the carries in the running back room, be one of the more involved receiving running backs in the league, and be an RB1 just based off of that. My RB9 is Ramondre Stevenson. And there's really just not much to say about Ramondre Stevenson. Like, I think this is right where ADP has him right now on underdog, uh, but he's going to post solid efficiency. I could see a dip in his receiving usage with Juju Smith-Schuster, Mike Gesicki now on the team, but the rushing volume with no Damian Harris could offset that. Like, this just seems we're running it, you know, it seems like we're running it back from what happened last season, but without Damian Harris, like maybe slightly up in the rushing game, slightly down in the receiving game, but otherwise this is a very similar situation. I feel like Ramondre Stevenson is just a high floor pick, probably going to finish as a solid RB1, not incredible ceiling, but a really high floor, I think. 
My RB8 is Brees Hall. This is a little bit above ADP as well. I think he's the RB11 right now on underdog. I have him at 14 games played. Maybe he just starts a little bit slow at the beginning of the season. You know, misses a game here and there. Um, but I got him at 14 games played. But I think he should dominate touches when he's back healthy. Like, when he's, when he's on the field and active, I would imagine that'll be because he took the first couple weeks off while still recovering from the ACL. And then we'll just hit the ground running when he returns. Maybe that's wishful thinking uh, now that I say it out loud based on, you know, ACL recovery rates and how guys do immediately in year one. But I think if he gave himself a couple weeks at the beginning of the season, I don't know. I might be talking out of my ass, but uh, 14 games played, and I think he'll be good when the healthy reports on his injury sound encouraging. And seems like most people are assuming, like, he's he's the RB11 by ADP. We're not assuming that he's going to have a really hard time here as a rookie getting back to form. He's being drafted as if he's... Brees Hall, the great running back prospect we saw in college, and Brees Hall, the great rookie running back we saw before he tore his ACL. So I think me assuming that he'll hit the ground running is fair in the context of what everyone else is thinking. I've successfully convinced myself that I'm good to go there, um, and he should dominate touches when he's back healthy. I have him regressing in yards per carry, yards per reception, and target share from where he was last season. His numbers were ridiculously high last season in at least two of those stats. And target share, he could get there, but I think Aaron Rodgers is probably going to hit wide receivers a little bit more often than, uh, who was it, Mike White just checking down to, to Brees, or Joe Flacco, whoever it was, just checking down to Brees Hall over and over again at the beginning of the season last year. So a little bit little bit of a dip in, in the receiving game. And he, just, he, he becomes the RB8 anyway, just like solid volume, solid receiving involvement. Uh, a little bit back to earth on the, the the efficiency standpoint. He could be even better than this. Like he could easily be a top three running back, especially late in the season once he gets his legs under him. And if he's more involved in the receiving game than I'm assuming, if he's able to be more efficient than I'm assuming, if Aaron Rodgers will be able to create a lot more touchdown opportunities um, than he had, definitely than he had last season. But if it's like to an extreme level and they're just humming on offense, Brees Hall could score 20 touchdowns. Like that's not out of the question. He could be an elite fantasy running back this year. Median outcome, if he's back healthy, I think is is a mid-level RB1 here where I have him at RB8. My RB7 is Nick Chubb. This is very similar to Jonathan Taylor. I thought that I was high on Nick Chubb. Turns out I'm not. He's being drafted as the RB4 right now on underdog, but his elite like hypothetical ceiling is predicated on a big increase in receiving work with Kareem Hunt gone on top of a big increase in offensive productivity and touchdown opportunities overall with Deshaun Watson on the team. But Watson has not historically targeted running backs at high rates. And while Nick Chubb is a great player, I, I think he's a great player. I think he could catch more passes. It's hard to make a case for like these long-standing trends in Deshaun Watson's play style suddenly shifting to allow for Nick Chubb to catch way more passes this season when Nick Chubb isn't like, like there's no reason for us to expect him to suddenly command much more receiving volume other than the fact that like a different guy is now no longer like, like it's not it's not like we know Nick Chubb to have like an Alvin Kamara skill set or even a Ramondre Stevenson skill set as a pass catcher it's not like we have one of those guys who's been underused suddenly getting an opportunity Nick Chubb is a great pure runner we don't know if he has like 70 reception upside and so it's hard to bet on that happening just because Kareem Hunt left and so I'm not betting on, betting on that happening. I do have him with career highs in targets, receptions, and receiving yards. Just nothing crazy. Like, I think I have him around 40 receptions, something like that. But it is true. It, it, it is true that if Deshaun Watson just gets this offense humming, Nick Chubb could score a ton of touchdowns. He could score 20 just like Brees Hall could. Maybe I'm underselling him as a receiver, but I think this is, this is a solid median expectation for him to just be around the RB6, RB7, RB8 range, like he always is. My RB6 is Josh Jacobs. There's the news that recently came out about him not getting signed to a long-term deal, playing under the tag this season, currently holding out. Well, not holding out, but just, just, I guess, is it a holdout? I don't, I, I don't know. He's not participating in team activities, whatever that means, right now. We don't know how long that'll last. I don't think he'll miss games, but I don't have any reason to think that other than I think he knows that it wouldn't do anything. Like, they're not going to give him money anyway. 
And so who knows what happens there? I'm just assuming he plays, but apparently this is four spots higher than ADP has him. So apparently I'm high on Josh Jacobs. And this is one that I kind of want to look at as the summer, you know, take a look at closer as the summer goes on. You know, maybe there's some development on the contract front, but I'm not assuming that. I just want to like mull this one over a little bit. I'm projecting him for a couple games missed due to injury um, after a massive workload last season. And if he's not working out with the team now, like I can't imagine he's just sitting on his ass until September, but if he's not in a team setting, like getting hit a little bit, wearing pads, like maybe it's difficult for him to get back into football shape right away and he misses a couple games. But when active, I also have him regressing in yards per carry, yards per reception, target share. Like he was just at massive numbers last season. But it's just hard when doing projections to not end up giving him a ton of rushing volume when the team still doesn't have any incentive to not run him into the ground and there's still not very many options behind him. Like the, like the backfield behind him is, I believe it's, essentially the same as it was last season, like Zamir White, Amir Abdullah, Brandon Bolden, uh, unless I'm just forgetting somebody that was of consequence. But Jacobs dominated touches anyway, so nobody was really of consequence last season, and this year's group doesn't seem any more liable to eat into his workload as last year's group. Maybe the holdout means Zamir White is, you know, getting first team reps, and so he's just able to kind of insert himself into the offense a little bit more even when Jacobs gets back. But it seems like Jacobs is going to see 75, 80% of the touches in this backfield regardless. Like, Zamir White's not a pass catcher. It's just hard to envision Jacobs finishing as anything other than an RB1, assuming he's healthy and assuming he, you know, is playing, like playing games. This this team's probably not going to be great with Jimmy Garoppolo at quarterback, but he's going to get a ton of volume. The, I, I feel like he's not going to be as good as last season, probably. That was a career year, but a ton of volume on an offense that's not going to be awful equals an RB1. My RB5 is Saquon Barkley. Basically same thing for him, you know, in terms of the contract situation. My, you know, kind of same analysis applies there. But I do have Saquon improving upon last season, even though I think I have him one spot lower than ADP has him. I have him back to like early prime Saquon year or, or numbers in yards per carry and yards per reception. Um, last year was kind of his kind of reacclimation after he was healthy from his ACL recovery. Now he's another year removed. I imagine he'll be just ready to go this season. And then the volume he was getting last season was awesome. If he just gets that and is a little bit more like prime Saquon, then the elite ceiling that he showed early on in his career, I think is within reach again, especially if this offense continues to improve. My RB4 is Tony Pollard. I have him three spots ahead of ADP. He's a really hard one to get a read on for me. He doesn't feel like a 250 plus carry guy. Like he's relatively tall and skinny for a running back. Not a huge guy, played wide receiver in college, has been like the 1B to Zeke for most of his career. Like, he just doesn't feel like a heavy volume guy. But, like, who else are they going to give the ball here? Malik Davis, Rico Doddle, Ronald Jones, Deuce Vaughn. Like, none of them seem like strong candidates to get, like, 100 carries. Like, I don't know who else who else but Tony Pollard is going to run the ball a lot here. And it also kind of feels like, well, now with Zeke out of the way and Pollard as, like, an undisputed lead back, he'll now be unleashed as a receiver but neither Mike McCarthy or Brian Schottenheimer, the head coach and the offensive coordinator, really have any history of unleashing running backs, of like maximizing running backs in the passing game. The last time we see, we saw Mike McCarthy calling plays, I don't, which I don't think he ever did in Dallas, but back in Green Bay, the last time we saw him in Green Bay, he was underutilizing Aaron Jones in every facet of the game. Uh, Tony Pollard has maxed out at like 39 receptions, I think 55 targets so far in his career. He's played, what, four, three, four years? He's a former wide receiver and clearly awesome out in space. Like, 39 targets is not enough for him. Schottenheimer was the OC in Seattle when they were just running the ball a ton with Chris Carson and Rashad Penny. Like, those guys weren't involved in the passing game much. So I, it seems difficult for me to assume that those two play callers, those two offensive, like, strategists are going to correctly identify that Tony Pollard needs to be used a bunch in the passing game, even though his talent does deserve it. And, and yeah, Tony Pollard could finish as the overall RB1, I think, if his target share is closer to, like, 13% than the 11% I'm currently giving him. But the increase in rushing volume on its own that he's likely to get is enough to vault him into, like, top five running back status. Like, I, I guess, apparently, I really like Tony Pollard in fantasy this year, even though I really don't know what to do with projecting him out as far as his role goes. My RB3 is Austin Eckler, who's also kind of a weird projection this year because of Kellen Moore now coordinating the Chargers offense. Kellen Moore's offensive coordinator seems like it will result in more rushing volume. The Chargers have been towards the top of the league in pass rate in 
the last few seasons at least. Cowboys have been more middle of the road. For a couple of the seasons of the Kellen Moore tenure, they were towards the bottom of the league in pass rate. So it seems like this will be, you know, they'll become more balanced on offense. But Eckler is like, he's still Austin Eckler. He's still like 205, maybe he's 210 now, but like, he's not a big running back. He's never been given heavy volume on the ground. He's obviously a great pass catcher. Like, he's, he's still who has you know, kind of necessitated the sort of usage he's received in the past. And this team's strength is going to be throwing the ball. Like, they have good weapons on the outside. Eckler's a pass-catching running back. Justin Herbert is good. I have Eckler projected for career highs, basically across the board in rushing numbers. I think I have him over a 1,000 yards for the first time in his career, 220-ish carries, something like that. And I do have him projected for receiving numbers that are lower than he's had since Melvin Gordon was on the team. But it's still good enough, like after everything, for another season above 19 points per game. And if Moore doesn't scale back his receiving usage, like if that connection between him and Herbert is just Justin Herbert wants to check down six times in the fourth quarter every week, if that just continues, there's no reason Austin Eckler can't be like a 20, you know, 21 point per game scoring overall RB1 again. Uh, my RB2, though, is Bijan Robinson. And I feel like I'm being relatively conservative in my projections with Bijan. I have him number six in carry share in the league. That doesn't seem crazy high. I have him with a target share that would have ranked 11th in the league last season among running backs. That doesn't seem crazy high considering what we know about his pass catching skill set, what's been said about, you know, his ability as a pass catcher and to split out why they've talked about him as an offensive weapon, like with, you know, in-house, the coaching staff has said that. 11th ranked target share doesn't seem crazy. I have him with a yards per carry that is 0.02 yards higher than what Tyler Algier did last season with the or with the with the Falcons. That doesn't that seems pretty conservative to me. I have him with a yards per reception that would have ranked 25th in the league last season among running backs. Nothing I feel like I'm doing here is 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 crazy. He just checks too many boxes to not be an awesome fantasy running back. Like he's a capable runner who's going to get a ton of volume like they they're paying him a lot of money. They drafted him really high. I guess they could shock us, and this could be like a 60-40 split with him and Algier, but it, it doesn't seem like it will be. It seems like Bijan will have, you know, 75% of the of the carries probably. He can catch passes. It just feels like a good situation. It's too good for him to be bad in fantasy. My RB1, obviously, then, is Christian McCaffrey. I have him at 21.5 points per game, which is, I think, a tiny bit higher than what he had last season, but lower than, like, his... His peak years, obviously. He's just a great player in a great situation, and it's like him versus the field for RB1, in my view. I have him at 21 points per game while touching the ball less and averaging fewer yards per reception and yards per carry than he did last season. All three of those are just like slight decreases, but I don't even think he needs to like assert himself more in the 49ers offense after an offseason that, you know, Kyle Shanahan could spend doing that. I don't think he I don't think that even needs to happen for him to be the RB1 in fantasy. But if it does, and he's better than like the this fairly conservative approach, I think results in him being he could be he could score 25 fantasy points per game again if this offense is good, if he's targeted a ton in the passing game, and he's like the go-to goal line option, he could break fantasy again. Those are my top 12 running backs. Follow me on Twitter at No More Parties. Go to NoMoreParties.com. Like and subscribe to this video and this channel while you're at it. And have a great have a great week. I'll see you in seven days. Peace.